when society doesn't give you the answer though, and then the answer, and that's the crazy thing when the actual answer to the problem that a lot of, especially when you're a kid and you're fat and when adults, when they become fat in older age, they tend to accept it as something they did to themselves. Like when you're a kid, you absolutely are aware that this is something you did not do to yourself. This is just something you're stuck with, but everyone treats you like you you have this problem that you need to fix. And like, yeah, for sure. Now it's your responsibility. But when you go to do the things that society tells you to do to fix it, all it does is make you more tired and more hungry. Like it's, it's just so defeating. Like, and then the, the solution is to eat meat. The one thing you're told is going to kill you and everyone. And the solution is to stop eating everything, but only eat meat. And that will actually heal you is so backwards to the way that everyone thinks. All right, today we've got Cassandra uh, uh, to uh, chat with. Cassandra, you, you may, there you go. So you unmuted yourself. Well, welcome. Good morning. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm also well. I am uh, looking forward to chatting with you. So tell us, uh, Cassandra, where are you located? Um, I live in Dayton, Ohio. Dayton, Ohio. Very nice. And how are things in Dayton, Ohio today? Uh, it's all right. It's pretty average weather. So. <laughs> Snap time for my kids, so my house is quiet for a change. Got it. Well, just well, let's just get into. It. Let's t- tell us a little bit about your background, if you don't mind. Um, I'm 35. Um, I have been obese since the day I was born. I was born premature and obese, and have been on a diet since I was five years old. So weight loss has been um, pretty um, much a, a linchpin in my life story, I guess. Um, so right now I'm currently like average healthy weight. I'm not considered obese. So I'm kind of just getting used to that. And I, I think that I, I give all the credit to that, to the carnivore diet for helping me learn how to, um, regulate my appetite. Yeah. Interesting. That is one of the interesting thing. A lot of people do report that they notice a lot more satiety and it's, it just, it just becomes very natural to eat. You're not always hungry all the time. So so you said you're, you you know, you're born premature obese, which is interesting because usually preemies are underweight and I don't know how premature you were, but you had a, uh, uh, so at five, you were on a diet. How, I mean, how, what was your, how heavy did you end up getting at some point? Um, well, I, I remember in kindergarten, we had to do like a, a challenge with pumpkins or, and we had to weigh ourselves in the pumpkin and figure out how much the pumpkin weighed with help from the teacher. And I was 110 pounds. And I guess I remember that being a really big deal, but my whole family was very large. Mm-hmm. So I didn't, con- I, I didn't really, it, it wasn't until school that I realized how big I was, but, um, my mom had gestational diabetes so bad. So all of her babies were very large right. and I was just her last one. So, um, I, I, by the time I was in um, middle school, around 11 years old, I had started Weight Watchers and they weighed me in at 208. Mm-hmm. Um, and then puberty kicked in for me and I stopped gaining weight, luckily, through high school. But then right after, um, I, right around 18, I started putting on weight again and made it all the way up to 250 and then to 280 in my mid-20s. Okay. So, and, and how tall are you? You're not like eight feet tall, are you, or anything like that? No, I am five foot four. So okay. that, that was quite a bit of weight. My yeah, BMI yeah. was about 36. I was pretty uncomfortable yeah, yeah. all the time. I tried every diet. So I would like, I would overly restrict. And then I would binge eat because I was just so really tired of restricting and starving all the time. Yeah. So the binge eating I developed as a child from like, just not having a lot of food around. Um, once I became a, once I started like implementing dieting all the time, like the binge eating just continued to get worse and worse. Cause I just like, well, I'm only going to eat 1200 calories and I could do that for two weeks. And then I would lose weight mm-hmm. and then I would just eat everything in sight and I would get stressed out and I'd go to the store and get every sweet junky cheap thing I could get and just eat everything possible. So yeah. it was really hard for me to learn how to implement balance and just like eat a little bit. <laughs> yeah, so a- I, would, I just always felt hungry. Never stopped. Yeah, there's a lot of people, you know, I mean, 1,200 calories is not much. And a lot of people criticize it. Well, that's not a way to do it because, you know, you're, that's always almost inevitably going to happen when you restrict yourself that bad calorically. Yeah. You're always well, I was such hungry. a fan of The Biggest Loser. I felt like yeah. that. I felt like yeah. I was doing the right thing. Right. Like it was, it came out when I was like at that like mid teen teenager age. And I thought, well, this is the way to lose weight. Look at them being successful. And I didn't have any idea that most of those people at the end of the day ended up failing. 
Like I just, I just wanted my before and after journey, you know? Right. Right. And, and so you, you went to Weight Watchers and, and I mean, yeah. that was under supervision, I suppose. What did they tell you to do? Right. I mean, they would probably, I, I went there with my mom and I learned about all about the point system. Mm -hmm. And, um, the first week I lost three pounds and then I couldn't lose any more weight after that. And I ate within their points. Like I was really diligent about it, but I, it, it didn't work for me. So after a month I stopped doing it because of the cost. Did so you, I, and then, did you ever try like a plant-based version? I know a lot of people that's popular to do that, to go on a plant-based diet. Did you ever um, do that? When I was 19, I tried um, vegetarianism. Mm -hmm. um, I have an aunt who's a vegetarian and I, I felt my, like I had like the whole bleeding heart. Like I just, I wanted to save the animal or the planet and I thought it would be the best way to do it. Um, and I ended up gaining even more weight and um, developing even more anxiety through, through that. And so that, didn't help me at all, but I continued that for almost a year because I thought I was doing the right thing. And then, um, somebody had a steak in front of me and I just couldn't turn it away. <laughs> so that ended my vegetarian streak for a little bit, but, um, yeah, I, wouldn't I was still after that, like I got really into like the organic foodie movement for a while. I thought that was going to be the cure to weight loss. Like I only ate organic foods and then I cut out all processed foods and I only ate organic non-processed foods. And I'd limit how much meat I would eat because meat was the problem. Mm -hmm. And I got sicker and sicker, even though I was able to lose weight for a little bit, because I tried running and extreme dieting and I lost about 80 pounds. And then I watched Dr. Lustig's um, speech where he talked about um, the sugar, a bitter truth mm -hmm. um, from, from like 2006 or something like that. I watched that, um, in 2015 for the second time. And it convinced me to quit eating sugar. And, um, that is when I got pregnant on accident. So three months, no sugar. And I was eating like all organic food and trying to, I was running every day and I was maintaining an 80 pound weight loss. And then all of a sudden, boom, I got pregnant and that was amazing and terrifying. Cause I, I was, um, I was like 29 and I, was told I was infertile and I was never going to have kids. And I was really comfortable with that decision at that point in my life. And so all of a sudden I had this baby and I gave up all dieting for the end of the pregnancy, but I kept up the extreme exercise. Um, and threw out my back a couple of times, had to see a chiropractor. Um, and then very quickly, a year later, I had another child because, um, I went back on cutting off the sugar. Like as soon as I quit breastfeeding my son, I cut the sugar out again because I wanted to lose weight again. And I was, I was sure sugar was the evil culprit. So I got pregnant a second time. And then through that pregnancy, um, I very nearly got, like I failed my first gestational diabetes test. And then um, right before the three hour test, I had, I talked to my OB. And at this point in my life, these low carb USA um, lectures had started coming into my YouTube feed. I watch a lot of science lectures on YouTube. Like I take a lot of um, college level courses online for free because money is not available to me, but YouTube is amazing. So, um, I started watching like, um, low carb, um, South Africa and just listening to what these people were saying and finding it really fascinating, but still terrified to change my diet during pregnancy. So I asked my doctor, like, do I need carbohydrates during pregnancy? Cause the gestational diabetes was a really scary thing for me. Cause that's kind of what led to a lot of my health issues that I have a physical disability because my birth was so traumatic. So I really didn't want to go through any of that with my kids. So, and my doctor thankfully was like, you know what? You don't need carbohydrates when you're pregnant. It's fine. Your liver's got your back. You'll be okay. You can cut them out. And I was like, you sure. I, I want to try this keto thing. She's like, you'll be okay. You'll be all right. Cause I was like 230 pounds and I had gained 40 pounds in three months of pregnancy. So she, um, she was like supportive. I'm sure. So, um, that was when I tried keto for the first time and I passed my second glucose test and I stopped gaining weight in pregnancy, but my baby continued to grow really well. Um, uh, my pregnancy went really well. I, um, delivery went normal. He came out perfectly fine. Everything was great with him, but I couldn't lose weight afterwards because I didn't realize that I was still binging so much on like, um, peanuts, sunflower seeds like anything that I could just grab a bag of out of my pantry, I would just sit and I'd eat the whole pound bag of them. 
and not even think about it because I'd be nursing a baby or, I'd, you know, I, I wouldn't even think about what I was doing. And um, that was when I had decided to also start watching Joe Rogan as like a, like an kind of an interest. Like I was just curious to see what like the other side was talking about. Like Joe Rogan was making all this like mud everywhere he went. And I was just curious to see what it was about. And I, I found actually that he had a lot of interesting things to talk about and his arguments were a lot more nuanced than a lot of people gave him credit for. So I kept watching and that was when I saw you on his channel and um, I listened to your podcast with him twice and I played it for my fiance and I was like, this sounds absolutely insane, but like, I'm so desperate to lose weight. I don't want to be obese anymore. What do you think? I just give it a, a month shot. And that was almost three years ago. My son was, is about to turn three and um, it was the best decision I've ever made. As far as I'm concerned, a lot of other people in my life are still a little confused by it, but like, I feel better than ever. I've never been able to be lean and not like count calories and just like not worry about what I'm eating. Like I get hungry and then I eat and then I move on with my life. And like I eat for like an hour out of the day. And then I spend a whole lot of time talking to other people about what I eat. <laughs> but then the rest of my time, like I get to do so much other stuff and I'm free from food. And a lot of people think that I'm restricted and like, I'm getting married in October, which is amazing. And I get to have this amazing dress that I never thought I'd be able. I had, I bought a plus size dress and I just spent a fortune to get it resized to fit my new body. And I'm so proud. I don't care at this point because it looks amazing and I'm so proud. And like, I don't feel like I'm missing out on anything, not being able to eat cake on my wedding day. Like I'm going to have an amazing night all because like, I'm, we're going to have like ribeye and ribs and stuff and it'll be amazing. <laughs> Well, it sounds like, you know, it sounds like it's definitely changed your life, you know, going from someone who's kind of always been a beast to no longer in that situation. And that's got to feel pretty good, I imagine. Um, I've, I'm such a shy, introverted, quiet person. I don't typically wear colors or like, I, I find myself wearing, like, I, I bought colorful sundresses and I feel like very more um, attuned to my feminine side more than I ever have before in my life. Like, I just, it feels more comfortable in my body. I can use it how I want to. And I don't feel like I'm fighting myself all the time. I felt like I was aging so much. Like in my mid twenties, I, I could hardly stand up in the morning as steps became a challenge for me. And um, I've had really severe lipedema since I was 10 years old. Um, so I've always carried most of my weight around my hips and my belly and my legs and my butt have just always been very massive. Like it's, it's, like it's been like the joke of my life is how big my backside is. And so now it's very normal and average size and my lip edema, like you wouldn't know I had it unless like, I like take my clothes off and show you like some of the traces in my skin where you can see a little bit of like the misshapen skin, but like you, you can't tell nobody would ever know unless I was like brave enough to put on a bikini and I'm not there yet. And I don't know if I ever would. Like even a swimsuit, I'd probably, I don't know. But anyway, I'm not one to show off, but I, I definitely feel more comfortable with myself than I ever have. And it, it is very nice. So it's not something I ever expected from changing the way I eat to affect so much in my life. Like I'm like the fact that I'm doing this is like, I have pretty severe anxiety, like very severe. Like I've thought about <laughs> canceling this a hundred times, but I'm here doing it. And I'm glad that I am because I think that the carnivore diet is so powerful. Like I, I want more people to try it and I'm never going to be able to convince the people I love around me. So if a couple of strangers can be convinced to change their lives on a whim because of something that they saw, like I'm here for it, you know? Well, well, thank you. And we're glad you're here for that too. So thank you for, for being brave enough to, to come on here and talk. Um, you know, one thing I thought you said that was kind of interesting, you said it made me feel more feminine and you say, I'm, I'm eating a bunch of steak, but I feel more feminine. Most people would think, well, that doesn't yeah. seem, seem to go well, but, but can you talk a little bit more about that? I mean, as far as, I mean, just, it, you know, it, it seems like, you know, there's a lot of people that are, that are just unhappy in general and, and maybe they don't feel like anything, but, uh, how does, how, yeah. how, how do you, what do you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, I've always, I, I also have body dysmorphia, so 
Uh, and I also think that comes from just being obese my whole life. I've always been just very more round than I am tall. Um, so um, just society, what like society tells you what femininity is. And then I would look at myself and not see that and never really figure out how those two could equate. Um, so I, as my body has changed and I believe there's also like a hormone change because my cycle is so regular. And like, like I said, like I'm able to, like, I'm so very, um, fertile now that me and my future husband have to be very cautious so that we don't have any more children before the wedding. So, um, I, I think just feeling more comfortable in my body allows me to put on more feminine clothes. Like I don't have to put on like shapers and all this stuff. Like I can just like, and I, I don't wear makeup in my face and my skin looks really nice. Like I've never really liked wearing makeup because it makes your skin so crappy. So I just tolerate not having it. But like now I look made up like my, I can, like my cheeks look rouged and like, that's just, you know, it's just natural. My hair hangs nicely. I have, um, what I call my carnivore hairs. Like ever since I started carnivore, I have a bunch of baby hairs that they're like about, it's hard to pull them out, but I have about hair. That's about like, I don't know, four inches long or so that started growing and filling in and making my hair even fuller when I started. And I don't eat a ton of steak because it's really expensive. Um, so I figured out, um, I go, I go to a box store, I go to Costco and I got a, a big wood smoker and we get big pork bellies. So I buy two 10 pound pork bellies every week and we run those to the smoker and I, I cut them into pieces. I need, I will, I'll fry up about a pound chunk of pork belly every morning for breakfast. And then if I'm hungry, I'll throw in like chicken tenders or um, whatever other meat is on sale. Cause it's really hard to get fatty meat <laughs> at a, an affordable rate. So pork belly is so far pretty cheap and it's delicious when I fry it up like and yeah, it's very strange to <laughs> anyone else to like eat a big piece of pork belly, but I need the fat. Like ever since I've gotten to a comfortable weight, fat has been really crucial to me. Like if I don't get enough, my digestion starts to fail. I start to get headaches. I get extra grumpy. My anxiety gets more intense. So like fat is really important. Yeah. I mean, so pork belly all day. Yeah. Fat, fat, certainly you need to have adequate fat. I think if you're not particularly, if you're not eating carbohydrates and it's interesting, you know, because, and, and, and this is a very important consideration because a lot of people, you know, it's, it's, it's financially expensive to eat anything these days with the inflation, yeah. everything's going up. And, and so, I mean, it's nice to say that you can still get good results eating cheaper cuts of meat. And, and some people have the misconception. Oh yeah. I have too. to, yeah. I have to budget within like, cause I, I have a family of four, so we're budgeting like uh, like I'm calculating the cost per meal per person as I'm, you know, thinking about what to buy for the week. And I can feed my family of four, like all four meals throughout the day for about $15. And I don't think that's terrible. Not you know, yet. I just have no. to, I buy in bulk and I'm careful about it. So, I mean, I'm sure people with a bigger budget that aren't in my situation can afford a, a lot more. So I've always, I didn't really notice much of a budget or a food budget change switching from an organic um, food diet to a conventional meat diet. Cause the, I tried, it, it would absolutely be impossible for me to do grass fed organic meat that, that just wouldn't be conceivable. But, um, I've not had any issues with the conventional meat and like a lot of the hives and stuff that I used to get have gone away besides oxalate dumping, which is a cyclical issue. But I've, I've recognized that from other people in the online communities that what, how oxalate dumping is its own kind of unique thing. Um, and it comes and goes. And, um, I definitely notice that it's heavily associated with my legs. Like my legs will flare up with a lot of pain and then I'll get like a rash in like a crevice somewhere on my body and then like itching and pain. And then my legs will shrink quite a bit. So I definitely, I don't know what I stored in my fat that my body doesn't enjoy processing at some point, but it's definitely like, as I process through fat tissue, it can be an issue, but I mean, that's going to be an issue on any diet, I imagine. So, well, and, and, and whether it's oxalate dumping or not, it's hard to say for sure. I mean, it could be, I mean, I know that that's a phenomenon that does apparently happen. So you'd mentioned, um, you know, you said something, your anxiety got worse or so, at some point. So it sounds like, you know, you had a number of things going outside of the obesity lipedema. Did you have some anxiety issues and, and has the diet impacted that as well? 
Yeah. Yeah. I've got, I'm, I have agoraphobia and PTSD and general, generalized anxiety disorder. Um, I won't say that any of them have been cured by carnivore. I've heard a lot of people say that carnivore has cured a lot of their mental illnesses. Um, a lot of my stuff is trauma-based and I'm still working through that. And I will say though, that like the generalized anxiety, just like the wake up in the morning, scared shitless is greatly reduced. My day-to-day life is a lot easier. Like all the things that I have to do on a regular basis that I can can take control of are a lot easier. I can use my skills that I've learned about in therapy for all these years and like actively Im- implement them in my life and make them beneficial to me instead of just talking points. Like, cause they would just throw stuff at me. And I was just like this whirlwind of chaos and nothing would stick. And they'd be like, you know, make a plan, make a list. And like, none of that would work. You know, I would just be in my crazy place, like overly cleaning my kid. My, I have, I clean when I get anxious a lot. So that's also another thing I've learned is that my house can be a little bit messy and that's okay, which is preferable to everyone else in my life. So <laughs> it has gotten better. Like it's, it's not a cure all, but it's definitely made it easier. And I think that it's made a bit more of a foothold for therapy to work more too. Yeah, you'd mentioned, you know, your mother w- was, uh, 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 diabetic I, I guess i think you said and you know, you yeah had gestational she's, diabetes. she's got some severe complications from diabetes yeah, yeah. yeah. and you said and you said that you you know you don't think you'll impact your your family at all and i you know I, I don't know i mean i think long enough time being an example you might find that they, they are impacted but um yeah i'm i'm the one i'm like the baby everywhere i'm the last child and i'm, I'm the youngest everywhere so um, I listen to Dr. Barry a lot and he, he talks about the whole pampered butt syndrome. If anyone was able to be around to change my diaper, they're not going to listen to me. And I definitely feel that, you know, <laughs> like they just, uh, there are my peers who will listen in my friend group. And, and then my family's just like, yeah, that's crazy. Cause I've tried every crazy diet and I don't blame them. So maybe I'm hopeful in a couple more years, they'll see that, you know, I'm sticking with it, the improvements are continued and they, I mean, there's, there's such a reality shift that you have to take to be willing to accept it though, that I don't, I don't know how easy that's going to be for people. Like I, I have a lot of people who are adverse to meat. like even the idea of eating red meat kind of turns their noses up in the air. So I don't know. It's, I think there's, there's room still for people to find balance where it works for them. If, If moderation can work for you, like, I think that that should be something you should stick with, but it's, it's just not for me. Like I, I can't moderate food. I, yeah. I come from a family of addicts and like, I thought I broke the cycle, but like for me, the, the full addiction is food. Like anything that's kind of sweet, even cheese will cause inflammation and I'll overeat it to the point where I get sick. So food is more than just food to me. It is, it is my comfort. So yeah. Yeah, that was uh, a, sorry that went off on another tangent. No, there. I mean that's a good tangent to go on because I and I've said that many times. You can't expect people to moderate food, which they can't moderate, and there's a lot of people who can't moderate certain foods, and so they just have to completely abstain from them. And for and that's one of the reasons why uh, particular people with food addiction, binge eating disorders, or other eating disorders do very well in this style of eating pattern because it's you know it's very simple, it's very restrictive, but it also has a physiologic effect that, that I think impacts. Right. Yeah. Like I can't binge on like pork belly or chicken or typically pork steaks or, but like I, and I eventually get full and that feeling of fullness is something that you never get on, on ice cream, even though you can eat till you vomit on ice cream, like, but I'll never feel full on it. Cause there's that extra dopamine switch that keeps telling me you you can get more, you can get more, you can get more. It'll make you feel better. So yeah, I, I, like I said, I challenge people to eat a, a lot of brisket. <laughs> I can't, <laughs> right, I can't yeah. you know, particularly not, you no. know, not not with all the sweet sauce on there, but just regular old brisket that's been smoked. And that is a challenge. Yeah. To, I get full on that. It, so it's it so is incredible. a challenge, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, how about, you know, you get the little kiddos, you got two little kids, congrats on that. And um, and your, your soon-to-be husband, is he on board with the diet and stuff like that? What is his thoughts? Oh, he went, as soon as I did it, his, his response wasn't like, I thought he was going to tell me I was crazy and that I should just be careful. But he actually said, you know, that sounds like a great idea. When he was a teenager, all he ever wanted to eat was meat. And he had to be convinced to eat vegetables and bread and stuff. So he, he always called it meditarianism. 
and thought it was a great idea. And he jumped right on board and he's, he actually has had, um, his own issues that have, um, resolved. Like he had, um, chronic, um, diarrhea that has resolved itself. Um, he had a hard time putting on muscle mass and that is definitely not an issue at all anymore. He doesn't work out and he looks like it all the time. Um, so like for him, it, it was very, an easy transition. He maybe he did lose a lot of weight at first. And since he didn't have a lot of muscle mass, I was concerned. So after like three months, I was like, Oh no, you should eat potatoes. <laughs> like I'm worried about you. He got, he got like uncomfortably thin, but he said he felt so great. And then three months later, he started putting on muscle really, really fast. And now he's bigger than he was before he started the diet and healthier than ever. And so that has moved to me kind of pushing it on to my children. I have a five-year-old five-year-old who's almost six and he ate a lot of wheat when he was a kid. And I, I, I fed him the organic diet. So he's struggled to switch. So I have to make him, um, chaffles with, um, I cook, I slow cook chicken with a whole bunch of rendered bacon fat. And then I mix that with eggs and I cook it in a waffle maker and he eats that and he loves it. Um, but he still will not eat anything that resembles meat. If it doesn't look like a processed food, he won't touch it because I spoiled him with the cookies and stuff. Yeah. Um, but my three-year-old who has been basically carnivore since he was weaned, won't eat, he won't eat other foods. Like he only wants to eat bacon. He only wants to eat meat. He only wants to eat cheese. Um, since his older brother eats apples, if the apple is peeled and perfect, he will eat that. Um, if they're, the strawberries are perfectly ripe, he'll touch them, but otherwise he'll, he'll just leave it off to the side and eat bacon. <laughs> so he's, they're definitely two different little kids, but they, they both are on a pretty ketogenic diet. And I, I, credit it to my five-year-old's um, behavior improvements. Cause he was just, he was a rough baby and a, he was rough for school and he he's had a hard time through life and he had screaming temper fits that would last for hours. So we tried keto on him because his doctor told me he was obese when he was two and a half. And so then all the red flags from me are like, Oh no, I don't want him to go through obesity. So I tried the keto diet on him. And I've never restricted how much he eats and he lost, um, all of the extra weight, but has continued to grow perfectly. He's been keto for, um, about two and a half years now and zero issues. The dentist loves us. Like when we go to the dentist, they're like, your children have the most perfect teeth ever because they've never gotten to really have fruit juice or anything like that. They're generally really well behaved. And so when I do give them treats here and there, like um, I've ha I had to keep my son gluten free. So everyone's gluten free because we all have an allergy if it's even present for us. So if I do give them a gluten free cookie as a treat, because when you're around other kids, like it, the societal pr pressure to treat your children with sugar is really strong. And like, I feel like I'm withholding something from them by not giving them this poison. So when I give them the poison, they can tolerate it really well. There's very little, little behavioral problems from it. And they go on about their life and get their meat the next day. And no one's had any issues besides, you know, when we start out school, I have to explain their diets, which can be a little strange, but well, I mean, it's, it's been all right. It's, it's, it is interesting to see how much food affects our behavior, our mental health, and then our kids' health. And you see it, you know, when kids get hopped up on sugar, there's sometimes like you said, they're uncontrollable. They're bouncing off the walls. They're screaming. Oh, yeah. Emotions are, are my my five-year-old would not listen to reason. He's, <clears throat> he's a little budding genius and all of his teachers think that, but like, you know, like he's, he's aware enough to know what he wants, but not aware enough of social rules to know how to calm down when you're not going to get it. And so he will just fight you for hours. As soon as he got language, he started debating forever and he like screaming debates. And we took the sugar out and all of a sudden he would sit and make eye contact with me and make reason with me. And he's become far more aware of his world. It, it's been an amazing improvement for him. So the, the people who think that the, the ketogenic diet is robbing their children of anything or stopping their growth. Like I, I, I question like how much people are actually poisoning their kids just for, to make themselves feel better about a drug that they take every day. Yes. Like get your kids used to it. I don't know.
Well, it is almost that, and it's gotten so much worse as we see the childhood childhood obesity rate soaring in this country, and it's been doing so for the last 30 years, yeah. and it's continued to grow. And we're getting, you know, we have something like 20% of our kids are overweight, and, and, and that number's going yeah. up too. So. Yeah, and once they make it past five or six and, they, and they're still obese, their chances of coming out of it are really low. Right. So they're, yeah. they're more likely to just stay obese their whole lives, and that's a pretty bad track for anyone to be on, like, it's, it's a very depressing place to be. Maybe not so much now. I, I've gotten, I, I do follow a lot of like trends, I guess, on YouTube. And it, and it does seem that there are more obese children now. So they're um, making groups for themselves to feel safer and like mm-hmm. fat acceptance spaces. Right. And I question the health of that, like the mental health aspects of being like in a fat acceptance movement. Like on one hand, it could be really nice to be told like, of course, like at any size and shape, you are worth love and respect. Like that, that's something that could have been hammered in hard, harder for me. But like to then suggest like diet diets are like not the answer and that you should never try to change yourself. And like, that, that's a scary place to go. So. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely agree. I think the, I mean, again, no one is, is there's no people out there that we should condemn or, or hate just on what they are, what condition or what medical condition they have for that way. But at the same time, to just sort of not try to work on that is a, is a real problem. And I think just to, to well, say, when society doesn't give you the answer though, and then the answer, and that's the crazy thing when the actual answer to the problem that a lot of, especially when you're a kid and you're fat and like, like when adult, when adults, when they become fat in older age, they tend to accept it as something they did to themselves. Like when you're a kid, you absolutely are aware that this is something you did not do to yourself. This is just something you're stuck with but everyone treats you like you ha- you have this problem that you need to fix. And like, yeah, for sure. Now it's your responsibility. But when you go to do the things that society tells you to do to fix it, all it does is make you more tired and more hungry. Like it's, it's just so defeating. Like, and then the, the solution is to eat meat. The one thing you're told is going to kill you and everyone. And the solution is to stop eating everything, but only eat meat. And that will actually heal you is so backwards to the way that everyone thinks it it does. It seems a little hopeless to find a solution for people because when you, when you, when you tell them this is the solution, they're just like, well, you've lost your mind. I'm not going to listen to anything else you have to say. Meat gives you cancer. Don't you know that? And people who eat meat get sicker sooner. Didn't you have you heard about these epidemiological studies? And like, so then you have to get into the nuances of randomized control trials based on epidemiological studies. And you've lost everyone at that point. They're not listening. So it, it does, it feels a little hopeless. Yeah. Like there, you can only be a testament so long with your health before, you know, just like when I see someone claims to be a healthy vegan, I assume maybe they're cheating and maybe that's what people assume about me too, you know? So it's, it's a tough spot to be in to try and convince people. Well, well, I, I think, you know, and, and most people say we need to, you know, the, the caloric balance sort of situation, you have to be in a caloric deficit. And the problem with that is it's not that it is, there isn't some, some something to that's, that. It's just that you can't control your appetite. And I think what, like you'd mentioned, you, you don't have to eat that much. You, you eat some meat and you're satisfied, you're satiated and, and and it's as simple as that in, in many cases and i think we see this again this demonization of a food and i and i, and I you know the more i look at it the more i'm convinced that it is uh, intentional and it is designed to keep people eating this processed food this highly addictive food and staying in this it's very situation. profitable for a lot of people well, of course yeah sure yeah Absolutely. It is. And, and you know, like I said, you know, one by one, one by one, we've got, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of these, and this is getting, this isn't going away. It's getting bigger and bigger. And, you know, uh, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I do, I do see it being a bigger impact on the next generation and just seeing, seeing people that I love still struggling through things, not willing to accept my advice because I've tried every crazy thing so far. Like, yeah. It does feel like well, this one works, guys. You know, of course, they're not going to listen to me. But like, it, it really does work. Like, I've, I've found peace in my body for the first time. And, and the whole thing about calorie deficits, I don't, I don't necessarily know if that's always the case, because every once in a while, I will calculate my calories. And I do hang out sometimes around 2000 calories a day. Sometimes I'll go even more than that. Sometimes I'll go less than that. Like, my like, some days I'll eat three pounds of meat. Cause like my cycle just says I'm super hungry or my hormones are telling me to eat a lot more. 
And then one day I'll eat a pound. So maybe that balances out to like calorie constricting, but like, it definitely doesn't feel like that's what I'm doing. So I, I don't know, like maybe if you are just really hungry all the time, maybe there's a nutrient you're missing. Like I definitely know I was protein deprived before I, I never ate enough protein. Yeah. So, well, I mean, you can, I mean, you can, you know, when you're eating more protein, you're, 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 there's a metabolic uh, requirement to, to, you know, some of those calories yeah. go away and there's, there, you know, again, people like David Ludwig and other continue to push out that, that carbohydrates tend to, uh, uh, you know, s- store fat more so than other macronutrients. I mean, that's debatable, but regardless, um, how much, so you had a peak weight of where you said 280, I think at one point, yeah. what, what, how much have you, how, how much have you kept off and, and where are you at on your weight loss compared to your highest? So I don't, I had to stop the scale a long time ago. Cause I would obsessively use it all the time. I do know that I am a small medium mm-hmm. and that I'm probably around 150 yeah. <laughs> and yeah. that, that could go down to 140. I don't think it's much more than that. Um, I feel very comfortable in my body. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, so that would be like over, you know, 120 plus pounds. Yeah. Um, I I've lost about a hundred since carnivore. Cause I had, I had experienced some weight loss on beforehand mm-hmm. um, by cutting calories and I, what I felt like was starvation and just pain. I have a, I still have a hip injury yeah. from all of that running that I did at almost 300 pounds. Um, how much, so, uh, and how long have you main, how, how long have you maintained the weight loss on carnivore? So it's so for me, it's been a super slow weight loss. Like the first year of carnivore, I lost 50 pounds. Mm-hmm. The second year of carnivore, I lost another maybe 50 pounds. And then this year I've probably lost another 20, 30 pounds. Mm -hmm. It's, it's been a really slow process for me because I have, I have really listened to a lot of the people who've said, you know, you've got to stop worrying about counting your calories. So like I just eat until I'm full. So I haven't lost weight quickly at all. Well, you don't need to, I mean, you're, 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 you don't have much more to lose if any. And so it's, it's, uh, I think, I mean, because I just had my wedding dress size, they told me I'm not allowed to lose any more weight until October. But like, I think maybe if I lost another 10 more pounds, I'd be happy. And any more than that, I would be concerned. I've been, I do have a, a decent amount of muscle mass. I've exercised my whole life because I've always thought that would make me healthier. So I've done like crunches and any, any type of exercise I've been able to do. I, I do yoga. Um, since running failed me, um, I've found, um, backpacking is a lot of fun and that's like a vacation I can take with my fiance. And so I, I, I keep active however I can. I just, I don't really want, I don't see myself. I wouldn't be comfortable being very thin. I, I think that would be strange, I guess, probably because I've always been large and I have a large frame that that's kind of what's kept me so big too. Like I'm very stocky and I don't, necessarily want to lose lose the curves that make me feel so womanly for the first time in my life i guess so and there's and there's nothing wrong with having some muscle too i mean that's great i mean i i don't i wouldn't want to i i don't want to be skinny personally i like i like having a little bit more a little more uh masculine. Yeah, as a female though yeah. that's really hit hard though yeah, like you right. know women are tiny and yeah. you know i i kind of fight it like i i feel the draw a little bit too but like i don't really want to now i know how i could right like i I've learned to control my appetite so well, like I could finally like do the crazy starvation diet stuff that I'd always wanted to do my whole life. But like now I have enough reason with myself, like it has finally come to a place where I don't want to just be skinny. I want to be healthy. I like how good I feel. I can hike all day. I can keep up with my kids. I sometimes get like six hours of sleep and that sucks, but that's okay. And I still want to have more kids after the wedding is over. Good for you. Good for you. And then I'll sleep even less. Well, Cassandra, thank you so much for for being here. That's been a wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful to get to chat with you. And uh, good luck and congratulations on the upcoming wedding. Is are you? Thank you so much. Do you do any social media stuff? Is there anything you want to share uh, with that? Or no, actually, no. I I avoid social media. Actually, it, it can be rough. I I do. I I watch YouTube and the podcasts and stuff. They really help keep a lot of this normalized for me. So the the carnivore podcasts help on every extent so well awesome well thank you and so much and, for and, everything you do too. and this will this will obviously go on and inspire some other people so thank you good luck continued success and and i hope you have a uh, great uh you know more kids and <laughs> yes. breed more happy kids for the world okay
Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. See you, Cassandra. <laughs> Bye-bye now. You guys take care. We'll see, see everybody tomorrow. Bye-bye, Bye. guys.